we've talked about the high renaissance and what we're going to talk about now is a period that sometimes was called late renaissance but it's also been given the name mannerism and it, ha it, it, it derives from uh, Renaissance art. Uh, for example, uh, one of the leading practitioners, as you've already seen, is uh, Michelangelo. Um, so he's certainly both a high Renaissance and a Mannerist artist. Uh, so in the early 16th century, um, sort of a new style is developing, which is an artificial, imaginative, ambiguous in some ways, a style based on the exaggeration of elements in Renaissance art. For example, and you've seen the first one with Michelangelo, the exaggeration of contraposto, these uh, you know, very twisting uh, poses. And this we'll see with some other artists the elongation of ideal proportions, uh, figures that are more than nine heads tall. Usually the ideal was either eight or nine heads tall. And when they, uh, our figures would become tall and slender, we call them elongated. Now, the name mannerism derives from a name that was actually used uh, you know, in the 16th century. Uh, they talked about the manera, the manera. And the word means manner or style. And it often would have that connotation of sophisticated affectation. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. And I'll take that word style and how we use it. I mean, we've talked about artistic style, you know, using the visual elements. But we also use style, for example, um, when we're talking about uh, fashion. And we might say, oh, that person has style. And that does imply some kind of sophisticated affectation. In other words, the person who is you know, dressed with the perfect style and has the perfect attitude or uh, posture or gesture or something uh, may not get up out of bed looking like that. Uh, you know, they have to put it together, uh, makeup and the proper clothing, and, and they have to put on, uh, we would say, they put on an air. Well, that gives you a little bit of the idea of uh, manera. It is a manner, and so we call it mannerism. Now, it was an international art movement. Uh, we're not going to look at it everywhere, but uh, it begins in Florence and Rome around 1520. Okay, we'll talk about the Medici tombs. And it spreads throughout Europe. For example, um, in Antwerp, they talk about the Antwerp mannerists of the 16th century, whom we're not going to cover in this course. What I'm going to do is use one work of art by an artist named Pontormo, who was a Florentine painter, and we're going to do this, and uh, it's a Mannerist work, and we're going to compare it with a work by Raphael, you know, so epitomizes the High Renaissance. And uh, that's going to give you some of the characteristics and what we're talking about. Uh, uh, what is, you know, you, you'll see certainly similarities. I mean, obviously we have these uh, figures where there's, uh, they're, they're muscular, they're three-dimensional. Uh, uh, it's not so much a a different period than the Renaissance is an extension and, as we said, an exaggeration in many ways. You might think of it this way. Imagine you are a young artist and you're growing up in the shadow of Leonardo, of Michelangelo, and of Raphael. How are you going to surpass them at their own game? Well, Maybe you're going to become a mannerist. <laughs> uh, maybe you're going to exaggerate certain elements, you know, making uh, idealism, uh, you know, even uh, super ideal in a way. Uh, you know, these elongated forms that are uh, uh, so ideal they're not completely natural. So let's we're going to look at this and, and show what we mean by mannerism first with one work, and then I'll just show you a few other examples. Um, as we said, Pontormo is a Florentine painter. 
And this is, I think, just an exquisite work of art. Um, in about a century ago, uh, and maybe even and more, uh, some uh, people looked down at Mannerist art. We don't anymore. Uh, we find it. Uh, I was going to say very beguiling, actually. Um, so I, you know, I think this is an exquisitely beautiful uh, painting. Uh, but let's take a closer look at it and discuss it. Okay, first question: Ask yourself this: What subject is this work of art? <gasps> now, when I do this in class, I get the students to answer that. So you know, be mentally answering that. And I also tell them there's not one right answer. Your book may have one answer, which, okay, we'll use that one. But if you were writing out the title on an exam, I'd accept uh, several. Okay, what is it? Could this be uh, the entombment? It, well, first let's say that we can identify it as, as, as a Christian work of art. Uh, for one thing, it is in a church, the uh, Church of Santa Felicita in uh, Florence. Uh, and the figures here, we see this uh, lady in blue, uh, who is uh, the Virgin Mary, and uh, we see the dead Christ being carried uh, by other people. And perhaps I should point out some of the figures whom we you know, can identify, if identified uh, Mary and Christ. Right above the Virgin Mary uh, is a figure in uh, sort of a dull green leaning over, and that is uh, St. John the Evangelist. Um, there are a number of women, the holy women, presumably one of them may be Mary Magdalene, uh, uh, one of them maybe there's one who is holding a cloth, maybe that is uh, St. Veronica. You know, it's, it would be hard to know for sure, we can suggest. Um, and uh, who are these other figures? Uh, I, we don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, um, probably Nicodemus there. Uh, his head is, you know, over, sort of, if you look over Mary's arm, you see this uh, head staring out of a bearded man. That would be Nicodemus. Uh, the, the other two figures, you know, are they just uh, extras? Are they somebody who came to help? Uh, but, uh, you know, who are they? We don't know. Uh, okay, so we have a dead Christ, uh, we have the Virgin Mary, we have followers of Christ. Uh, so what could this be? And one suggestion is it is the entombment of the dead Christ. Uh, but then some of the more critical minds might say, wait a minute, what do you mean the entombment? There's no tomb there. What are you talking about? And then someone else once said, well, it's a descent from the cross. Well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Looks like people have you know, taking Christ down from the cross and they're carrying him away. Uh, of course, there's no cross in the picture. We have to imagine it outside the frame of the picture. So some people say, wait a minute, how can you have a descent from the cross without a cross? Okay, well, what are they all doing? They're lamenting, they're mourning the death of Christ. And there is a perfectly good subject in uh, the history of art, uh, develops in Byzantium and comes to Italy. Um, and. Uh, it's called the lamentation, or the lamentation over the body of Christ. To be perfectly frank, if you were writing out an answer, I'd accept any of those, <laughs> because the subject is somewhat ambiguous. Okay, let's look a little closer. What it's usually called, you'll find this in your textbook, is the title, is the entombment. Um, now, on a multiple choice exam, I would not try to fool somebody by having, you know, the entombment and the lamentation and the descent from the cross. Uh, I might have a crucifixion, you know, because it's obviously not that, uh, as a wrong answer. Um, but I wouldn't try to fool you. Um, if I did put the others, I would allow them to be uh, uh, acceptable choices. Um, but what I would probably do is just use the entombment and then have other uh, wrong answers uh, for you to choose from on a multiple choice format. Okay, so why is this the entombment? Well, let's look at uh, Raphael's painting that is also called the entombment. Uh, that's in the Vatican. And you'll see that what they're actually doing is carrying Christ to the tomb. Now, I don't think in the reproduction you can see the tomb, uh, but over in the upper left of the, uh, the painting by Raphael, um, there is a 
a cave or an opening in the uh, cliff side, and within it you can see uh, a sarcophagus. So the tomb is actually visible in the painting. Um, and we'll look at a little bigger version so I can point out some other things about this. But you can see Christ is being carried to the tomb, and uh, the crosses are up on the hillside. So we know where he's coming from, and we know where he's going because we see the tomb. So it's clearly, you know, Christ is being carried to the tomb. And rather than say all that, they just call it the entombment. So that's what's going on, uh, probably, uh, with the Pantormo's picture. Uh, Christ is being carried to the tomb, but we don't see the cross and we don't see the tomb. So that leaves it mm, a little in mannerist ambiguity. Uh, we often talk about this, uh, both visually and uh, sometimes very complicated iconography, uh, the, the idea of mannerist ambiguity. Uh, and here, as you look at the Raphael lamentation, uh, you can see up on the hillside the crosses that Christ has been taken down from. And you can see how Christ is being carried, and uh, if you could see the original work, you would see the opening in the tomb. I think uh, you can see just a little bit of sort of a white space behind uh, the, the man who is on the far left, his, behind his shoulder, uh, there's a little bit of white. That is the uh, sarcophagus that they are carrying Christ to. Um, so it's clear what's going on here. Uh, you sort of scratch your head a little bit and try to figure it out uh, in the Pantormo. Now, we want to look at uh, more about the style. And you'll notice that with Raphael's painting, we have believable depth. Uh, you can kind of map it out. It's very The figures look very solid, very three-dimensional. They are in space um, that uh, seems to um, accommodate the figure and just uh, a landscape that goes far, far back. Uh, we can call this planar recession because uh, if you look at the way the figures are arranged, for example, we have Christ uh, and the, the men who are carrying him in the foreground. It serves as a uh, plane across the surface of the painting. So in the foreground, you see Christ being carried by uh, two men and uh, other figures, including Mary Magdalene, uh, just slightly behind him. And so this is in uh, the plane that is across the surface of the picture. And that's a little bit further, the figures on the other side of Christ. And then if you look at the uh, group over on the right uh, with the Virgin Mary who is just swooned away. She is just, you know, passing out with grief. Uh, and she is uh, being succored by uh, three holy women. Well, that's uh, a little bit further back. That's another plane. And then if you look at the way the uh, hills come in, they all seem to be parallel to the picture plane. And you can uh, sort of uh, go back uh, rationally, uh, sometimes called intelligibly, in a sort of uh, a, a measured space. It makes perfect sense uh, as it goes back into space. Now, when we look at Pantormo's picture, his, the Mannerist picture, uh, Space is ambiguous again. Space is comp the figures are arranged very complexly, uh, and there's something kind of illogical going on there. Um, one of the things is you have these figures which are perfectly solid, you know, for 3D, and yet you don't have that kind of landscape going in the background. The only suggestions of landscape is you got a rock down there in the foreground and some pebbles, and then there's hey, there's one cloud up there, sort of filling in uh, the upper left, uh, but that really isn't enough to give you a sense of space. And then as you start analyzing how the figures are arranged, uh, well, look at St. John. Uh, St. John is the figure who sort of hovers over the Virgin Mary. Wait, he's much too small to be there. And what, what, how, he, how do you get up there? What's he standing on? You know, uh, is he hovering in, in the sky, well, levitating? Well, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, is there, you know, I always say, is there a ladder back there he's standing on? <laughs> um, does the ground rise sharply? We can't tell. We can't make any sense out of it. And also, Virgin Mary is much larger uh, than, than John. And so he would have to be further back, but he seems to be leaning over her. So there's this, you know, this complexity and paradox and a kind of illogic of some of the space. You know, it, it's hard to figure out. And uh, what I wrote was 3D figures in 2D space. What I really want to say is in shallow space. It's not really flat. 
Uh, but it's almost as though you had like two pieces of glass and one is the back and they can't go any further back than that and one is the front and they can't go any further front and so they have to rise up <laughs> uh, which of course uh, this is a uh, vertical uh, format for the uh, for the painting so they're rising up uh, and it's almost as though they're between you know two uh, areas they cannot pass uh, so it's really shallow rather than two-dimensional space, but shallow didn't fit. Uh, uh, it was too many letters. So that's why I put it in quotation marks. Now, in the Renaissance, we saw that particularly with um, the Renaissance in Florence and the Renaissance in Rome, most compositions were centralized. And most compositions were symmetrical. And that's why I put usually. Uh, this is very clear what's going on. It's very clear how it's arranged. But uh, it is not centralized. Christ, the main figure, is uh, what off to one side. And the reason for that is because he's showing movement. Um, if it were a lamentation, you know, he'd probably have Christ right in the, matter, in the middle and everyone grouped around him. But he's showing Christ being carried to the tomb. So, you know, there's a sense of moving off in one direction and then being balanced uh, on the other side with the, uh, the uh, second group of figures with Mary and then, of course, the landscape in the background. So it's clear, uh, usually, but not in this case, centralized. Um, the painting by Pintormo has actually been called a central. Uh, just afraid a few people might not quite get that, so I did write not centralized. And once again, it's it's uh, the composition is very complicated. Uh, it seems to be based on forms that are swirling around a center, almost kind of. Uh, you know, each figure is curving around, particularly uh, you'll see Christ and uh, Mary. But what is the center? The center is this hand of uh, one of the holy women uh, holding um, a cloth. Oh, why should that be the center? You know, if, if it were St. Veronica, which I suspect it may be, uh, holding up her veil and we would see the face of Christ, that may make some sense. Um, but just you know, sort of clutching this in her hands, uh, why is this in the center? Um, and we talked about the, the strangeness of some of the spatial relationships. Let me also point out something else that it just boggles the mind. Uh, if you can see this, if you can look closely, uh, right above Christ's torso, uh, we see his hand being held up by two other hands. I defy you to figure out, I mean, you can pick something, but how do those arms connect to anybody's body? You know, the first thing you think is, well, maybe this girl with this sort of green turban whose head is right above Christ's head, maybe those are her arms. And then you try to figure out how could they fit on her body? And you're, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. And then it gets worse because you realize that there are two left hands. But if it is the man who is carrying the upper part of Christ, and that lower hand is is his. Um, it's in a fairly awkward position to hold him. So there's all sorts of you know sort of strange, ambiguous things going on here. Um, but instead of being uh, centralized with the main important figure in the center, uh, the two main figures are on either side of the center, and it forms a kind of circular or, uh, in some cases, ovoid shape. Figure proportions. Well, we've talked about Renaissance figure proportions, uh, that they are based on a mathematical ideal uh, that goes back to classical antiquity. And uh, we know, of course, that uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo and indeed Raphael all worked with uh, figure proportions and trying to find the most beautiful, the most ideal figure proportions. But the Renaissance is basing the figure proportions on nature. They are idealized, but they are still natural. Mannerism, uh, there was a word they used, invenzione, which of course sounds like invention. And uh, yes, it is invention. We tend to think of inventions as being something like technology, you know. Uh, Thomas Edison invents the light bulb. Uh, but uh, in this case, it's used in the sense of imagination. What can I come up with that's new and original? And that's when you show your invenzione, your invention or your uh, imagination as, a, as, a, as an artist. Um, so the proportions sometimes 
take on some things that you don't think you'll ever find in nature. Um, with Pontormo's figures, you'll notice the heads seem to be relatively small to the body. They are indeed elongated slightly. Uh, and something I think is exquisitely beautiful. I mean, there's nothing wrong with changing the proportions from the ideal. Uh, and in this case, they're making it, I think, you know, they're trying to make it even more ideal, even more beautiful. Uh, you'll notice that he has uh, the forearms and the calves of the le lower leg, of the lower arm, the lower leg, um, swell out in this beautiful curving form. And then they taper in uh, and just form this, these, you know, these graceful shapes. So you do have uh, elongated proportions and uh, some exaggeration of some of the curving parts of the body. Uh, got tiny little feet. <laughs> to match the relatively small heads, I guess. Um, related to the figure, of course, would be whatever poses you have. And once again, um, with uh, Raphael, you have this natural, clear gestures. You know what's going on. Uh, you know, everybody is doing, you know, you're uh, holding the Virgin Mary, you're carrying Christ, you know, everything's clear. Um, all these pa figures in Pedormo's painting are they almost seem to be twisted uh, together in a very complex arrangement. Um, of course, you have the, the one guy in the foreground who's you know kneeling down with a burden of burying Christ, and he twists his head over and looks out at us with this frankly haunted gesture, a uh, haunted expression. Um, we we talked about how uh, natural that pose is for the uh, hand, the two left hands holding up Christ. You know, where are they coming from? What are they doing? Um, so, you know, there are some, some strange things that going on in this uh, picture. And the same thing we can say about the relationship to the figures, how it's very clear with Raphael where everybody is. They have a space that they can uh, exist in. Um, and yet with the uh, Pintormo's figures, as we said, they you know they almost seem to be compressed uh, into a shallow space. Uh, and then they are, you know, in, intertwined and you try to figure out the compositional elements and uh, how these forms are related. Uh, and it's still, it's very beautiful. <laughs> One of the interesting things is emotion. Uh, in Renaissance art, you remember we talked about that idea of restraint that they wanted to show the movements of the mind so that you would understand uh, you know, what the uh, painted or card figures are supposed to be thinking or feeling. And yet there was the idea that the emotion should be restrained. So, you know, the figures aren't you know, wildly gesturing or something like this. Um, with mannerism, you have two extremes. You either have, as we have here, extremely emotive pictures, or sometimes you have paintings where the subject seems to want to have. You know, the subject seems to be something you think would be emotional, and yet the figures seem to be passionless. Uh, or sometimes they seem to be very theatrical, you know, like they're uh, acting uh, uh, and a bit exaggerated uh, to showing the emotion. Well, this particular work is one of the ones which is extremely em emotive. Um, and you notice particularly the two people carrying Christ stare out at us. And uh, Pontormo uses a particular uh, shape of eye. I don't think you can really see it in the details here. I don't think you can really see it in the, in the reproductions here uh, because, of course, they're showing the whole picture, not the little details. But the eyes are um, sort of rounded, heavy lidded, and they're very round. And then he has uh, shadows around them. Uh, and this was something that his master, the high Renaissance painter Andrea del Sarto, often uh, used as well. Uh, and Pontormo perhaps carries it a bit further. Here, those shaded eyes, uh, those shadowed eyes, look out at the viewer with these uh, two foreground, these two figures who are carrying Christ, and they look lost. They look like they are in despair. And, you know, it, I think that brings home emotionally to the viewer what's going on here. Christ has died. They didn't expect that. They didn't. How could he die? How could, you know, his mission be over? And his mother, as you can see, is, mo is distraught. 
and um, you know the women are you know some of the women are trying to help her, uh, and John is kind of hovering over her you know uh, protectively. How how could this happen? And in this feeling of despair. Now you know uh, you know people who know uh, about Christian art and uh, the Christian religion know that uh, it was believed that Christ rose from the dead. That this isn't the end. That the mission continues uh, with a miracle of <laughs> what uh, outstanding proportions. Um, but. Uh, you get the feeling of how the apostles must have felt, how the followers of Christ must have felt that all is lost. And that's very much conveyed by uh, some of the facial expressions. Now, one of the things, um, I, this list that I'm using actually is derived from, but somewhat changed from, uh, a list that uh, Frederick Hart included in his book on the art of uh, the Italian Renaissance. Uh, and in that, he also included color. And you'll notice I used a kind of strange colored background where it blends from uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, what uh, pinkish, lavenderish pictures uh, uh, into uh, uh, different shades of blue. Uh, and I did pull those from the Pintormo, as you can see, um, but they're also there for a reason. Uh, one of the things that Hart said was that Renaissance colors are very clear. You can name them. You can say, okay, this is a yellow, you know, this is a green, this is a blue, this is red. Um, and uh, they're usually related to the primary and secondary colors, reds, blues. Uh, yellows, th those yellows are often ochres, but they're, they're still yellow range. Um, green, violet, don't see too many oranges. Um, yeah, there are some, yeah. Michelangelo uses orange, okay. Uh, oranges. <laughs> um, and Mannerist, he said they have these surprising combinations, these surprising uh, contrasts of color. And, and certainly you can see uh, within the Pontormo, uh, you do have some very strange things going on. Uh, and we'll just take a look at this man uh, who is kneeling here holding Christ. Uh, it looks like he's a nude figure, but if you, uh, if, you know, if, the, if you could really see it and look closer, he has kind of a lavender skin tone. And then somewhere around the elbow, uh, we just see the hand, and the hand is, uh, you know, a more normal flesh tone. Um, they haven't invented lycra yet. <laughs> uh, it's almost as though he's got a you know a transparent body stocking that is a, a lavenderish, pinkish shade. It's it's hard to define what it is, um, but that's very strange. Uh, we mentioned you know this uh, dull green that um, uh, Saint John has on, and once again it seems to be a form fitting garment. Uh, there are places and uh, where this the 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 arm that you know is coming out uh, from behind Christ's neck, uh, the shading is really interesting because it seems like the highlight is this light blue, and then uh, the shadow is, it's, it's a very hard to name color, it's a lavenderish, pinkish uh, uh, tone, what is it? You know, you can't, how do I name it? Um, and you may remember when we looked at the Sistine Chapel, we saw some of that with Michelangelo's paintings. But the problem was when Frederick Hart first wrote the book, the Sistine Chapel ceiling was still covered with dirt. And when they cleaned it, they discovered these surprising color combinations. Um, one of them is, you know, some of them are very much like that arm I just pointed out, where you have two different colors shading one another. And Michelangelo is doing them as early as what is the Sistine Chapel, uh, you know, 1508 to 12. So, you know, plus or minus 1510. Um, and we think of mannerism as coming in, you know, closer to the 20s. So after those were discovered, um, some of the scholars said, well, maybe we have to reconsider that definition of manner, these being mannerist colors, and just simply consider them Florentine colors. Okay, let me summarize this. Renaissance style 
can be considered idealism, but an idealism based on the observation of the natural world. Mannerism, or late Renaissance, uh, can be seen as an artificial style. It's based on Renaissance art and exaggerated it. You know, like um, the the ideal elong, the ideal proportions become elongated, and and uh, uh, there's certain very beautiful uh, exaggerations of it. But maybe you're not likely to see Pintormo's people in nature. Let me show you one of the most extreme examples of mannerism in Italian art. And this is by the artist whose name is uh, Mazuola, but we never call him that. We always call him, and this is the name you need to know him by, Parmigianino, which means something like the little guy from Parma. Uh, Parmigianino was working, of course, in Parma. Uh, he actually came down to Rome. He was in Rome during the sack of Rome in uh, 1527. And um, he actually gave up painting to study alchemy. I think he thought he was going to be able to change lead into gold or something. Um, hmm. um, but at any rate, uh, this is his most famous painting. It's known as the Madonna with the long neck, and you can see why. Uh, there is this uh, elegant swan-like neck uh, uh, that Mary has. Uh, and when you look into the background, uh, up in the upper right, and uh, really the the whole right side except for the very bottom, and there are some things that are unfinished there as well. Uh, it's unfinished. Uh, that uh, sort of reddish brown uh, is uh, the uh, under the uh, ground on which he would be painting. Um, and those columns, they're not a single column, and you can tell that when you look at the bottom and we'll see a detail, uh, they were going to be a row of columns, a colonnade. So there would have probably would have been the top of a building there. Now, if you remember one thing about this painting, remember what you can see just by looking at it, that he uses elongated proportions, uh, that this painting epitomizes the elegant exaggeration of Renaissance idealism. And one of the ideas was that uh, these elongated proportions, uh, you know, they were just so very, very, very beautiful. And so, you know, here Mary has become this elegant figure. And I'll make a um, parallel in sort of modern society. I'm sure that many of you have seen uh, fashion drawings, uh, you know, which are elongated. They're just stretched out. The figures are impossibly long and slender. And we say, oh, how elegant they are. You know, the clothes will look so beautiful on them or something. Uh, it's kind of the same thing. You know, uh, people aren't really maybe those proportions, but it looks beautiful. Um, and so here we have uh, the elongation of Mary. Uh, the angels standing beside her are also elongated, very slender. And even the Christ child, I mean, you think of the Christ child as being this you know, little chubby little baby, uh, but he has these stretched out proportions. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the iconography of that. I, I think uh, stylistically, I want, do want you to remember uh, this uh, and the elongated, elegant proportions of Parmigianito's Madonna of the Long Neck. But some of you might be interested in, in some of the uh, iconographical references. Um, you may have noticed that Christ lying on Mary's lap as a baby has his arm uh, hanging down uh, and it looks a very mature pose, actually. Uh, the pose reminds us of the pose of uh, Christ lying on Mary's lap in Michelangelo's Pietà. And you'll find this uh, throughout history, that sometimes artists quote very famous works of art. It adds another level of meaning uh, to uh, their work, uh, sort of referencing uh, uh, the uh, the previous work and uh, bringing in some of that meaning into their painting. And this is something that uh, you know, we'll, I think we'll see again, uh, the idea of a reminding us of the Pietà. Uh, in this case, it is Christ himself as a baby.
he is sleeping on his mother's lap. As when he has died on the cross, he will be once again cradled in his mother's lap as, as, when he was an infant, as she mourns. So there is this feeling both of uh, what a tenderness and sorrow that can be combined here. And that reference to the death of Christ is not particularly uh, you know, limited to the pose. Um, the angel who is holding the vase that is, uh, you know, he's holding this vase next to uh, the figures, and on that vase is one large cross and two smaller ones. So it's you know clear reference uh, to the crucifixion and the death of Christ. You might notice that there is an emphasis on Mary's stomach, or her womb, actually, uh, that the drapery folds surround it, and uh, her, her garment gets very, very transparent. You can kind of make out uh, you know, the umbilicus and the shape of her womb. Uh, and as you notice, the, the vase is held up, uh, the amphora is held up uh, sort of parallel uh, to Mary's womb. And I think there's, you know, there's no, um, and I think that's definitely not an accident because Mary was considered to be the mother of God who bore the savior of the world, the one who would be crucified in her womb. His first sacrifice was um, coming into human flesh, you know, actually becoming man as his first sacrifice, which culminates on the sacrifice uh, of his death on the cross. And um, in that idea of Mary as the mother of God, of course, goes back to, um, I think, 431, the Council of Ephesus, uh, where Mary is uh, declared uh, in Greek the Theotokos, uh, the word in Latin would translate as the mother of God. Uh, Theotokos is God-bearer. Uh, the idea was that um, Christians had believed, uh, at least since the uh, First Nicene Council, in the uh, fourth century, uh, they had decided that uh, Christ was both divine and human, and you couldn't separate them. You can say, okay, on Monday, Wednesday, and uh, Fridays, he's going to be human, and on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, he's going to be divine. Uh, it didn't work that way. Uh, they decided that you could not separate them. So if the human Christ and the divine Christ, as the Christians believed, were combined and could not be separated, then the child that is growing in Mary's womb must be the divine Christ. And so she was named the mother of God. And the womb of a woman was often likened to a vase. You know, which contains something, uh, and specifically Mary. Uh, she, what, there's um, <laughs> maybe I should. I don't know if I should get into this or not. But there is this uh, 17th century Jesuit who made a list of all of the uh, titles of Mary, things that she was called, uh, and it stretches. Uh, it's pages with the printed version, which is printed in the late 19th century, I think. But anyway, it has uh, two columns on each page, and there's over a thousand pages of it. And he has them all in alphabetical order, and then the reference to what was below. Um, it's uh, Hippolytus Maracci's uh, Polyanthemia uh, Mariana, or Encomia Mariana, in praise of Mary. At any rate, in that, there are many references to Mary uh, as uh, you know, the vase, uh, the, or the urna, the urn, or the vase, uh, that you know, contained uh, the uh, Christ child. And then uh, you can look uh, and see that we have in the background, uh, uh, this what looks like a column, and we'll show you closer up, uh, this was actually going to be a temple. And we have a lot of drawings uh, that were preparatory drawings for this. And here I'm showing you one at the top uh, where you can see uh, the pose is very, very similar, but he's made changes. He's added angels and uh, taken out John the Baptist and put the Christ child on Mary's lap. Uh, but behind her is a uh, temple. You, know, you can see the uh, facade, the range of uh, a colonnade. 
and so I have written a paper about this, uh, which deals with uh, Mary as a, a temple or a tabernacle. And once again, you can find many references in uh, uh, the Christian exegesis or Christian commentary. Uh, and here we have this detail. Uh, and you have a figure here, which, you know, if there was no other evidence, I'd just say, okay, it has to be Isaiah. Isaiah saying that a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. You know, and he's, uh, usually prophets have scrolls, and he seems to have this large scroll. And once again, you can see this is a very elongated figure. Uh, you can also see the base of the columns that, yes, indeed, I'm not making it up. This was going to be uh, a colonnade, uh, the uh, uh, portico of a temple, of a classical temple. Um, and if you look down next to uh, this figure, you can see uh, another foot. There's an extra foot there. It looks like a figure that has been painted out, but uh, they didn't, he didn't finish painting it out. And we do have a drawing uh, of this showing a figure of St. Jerome and St. Francis, two figures there. So the other possibility might be that this is uh, not a Old Testament prophet, uh, but is St. Jerome, um, the uh, translator of the Bible and the writer of uh, many, of course, uh, uh, many writings. Um, and he also was one of the great champions of the virginity of Mary. Uh, to him, it was virtually blasphemous to suggest uh, that Mary could have ever had sex or have ever had other children. Um, so it would tie in uh, you know, to this idea of uh, miraculous uh, birth. Um, so as you can see, uh, we can't be quite sure whether it's Jerome or whether it's Isaiah or you know who is he, but uh, uh, there's several possibilities, and they certainly uh, relate to uh, the main image of Mary in the Christ Child. Okay, let's get another example of Mannerist sculpture. Uh, we've looked, of course, at uh, Michelangelo's sculpture, but let's look at somebody else, uh, someone who lives uh, a little bit later, as you can see. I mean, their lives overlap. Uh, uh, Michelangelo was born in 1475 and died in 1564. Um, this artist is known as Giovanni da Bologna, um, but he was actually born in uh, Flanders and he trained in Antwerp before he came down to Italy. And uh, then he decided to settle in uh, Florence and he became very, very active in Florence for but the rest of his life. So uh, even though he was born in Flanders and even trained there, uh, his style is so much Florentine mannerist that he is considered to be a Florentine um, artist. So if I offered Flanders as a choice for you, uh, and you had to pick what his, where he was from, you could pick either Flanders or Florence. Uh, or I might just let, let you let, leave that out and just let you know where he is uh, active. Maybe that would be a better way to write the question. So let's look at a uh, work by Giovanni da Bologna. Now you'll notice that I wrote another name underneath it in parentheses, Jean Bologna. Uh, that's the contraction of his name. And I have to admit, rather than say Giovanni da Bologna all the time, I usually just call him Jean Bologna. It's kind of fun to say, too. Jean Bologna. <laughs> um, uh, he worked in both marble and bronze. And he did uh, some large statues. But he also did some of these small figurines, some of these small statuettes, uh, which are, you know, tabletop size. Um, and this really does fit in with this whole idea of, of, of a mannerist, uh, uh, courtly connoisseur who, uh, you know, buys these beautiful art objects and has them around his house to examine and contemplate and show his guests how wonderful his taste is. <laughs> um, and so we do, we have these just beautiful little uh, figures. This one, as you can see, is just over 15 inches high. Um, one of the mannerist ambiguity things about uh, some of John Bologna's work, not all, but some of it, is um, there are a few pieces like this one where they seem to have, uh, well, in this case, it's an alternate title. In another case, it's like he may not have decided the title in, or the subject until the very, you know, after he gets it made. Um, in this case, you'll sometimes see it called astronomy and sometimes called Venus Urena. 
and I need to explain that, I suppose. Uh, if you look at her attributes, or the objects that are here, in this case, at her feet, uh, you'll see a celestial globe, a globe of the heavens. And hence, astronomy, you know, someone who's studying the stars. And so she would be the personification, uh, uh, the symbol, if you will, of astronomy. Um, but there is also a, a second possibility. Who else might it be associated with the uh, celestial globe? Um, well, going back to the 15th century, Marcello Ficino, uh, the great humanist scholar of Florence, wrote a tract in which he talked about the three Venuses. Now, this, of course, was symbolic. Uh, and he talked about uh, the Venus, the celestial Venus, which represents divine love, and the love of God. Uh, the uh, terrestrial or human Venus, which is human love and generation. And then there is the bestial Venus, or the carnal Venus, who is you know, animalistic lust. Uh, so instead of one Venus, you have three that represent three different types of love. Well, the celestial Venus uh, was supposed to be, and he did, get, you know, there are various myths, uh, but of course you know the myth that we've already talked about with Botticelli's uh, Primavera about the birth of Venus, that uh, he is, she is born from uh, the severed genitals of, uh, what, Saturn, Kronos, Uranus, I don't know, uh, God has many names, uh, and hence Urana. Uh, born of the foam of the sea, impregnated by the severed genitals of uh, uh, the uh, god, in this case, Uranus. So she is uh, the celestial Venus uh, born of this other god. Um, okay, well, see, you can get very erudite, and uh, we might even imagine uh, that the patrons of this work would, would like that fact, that they could interpret it several ways, and they could put on layers of meaning, besides just looking at it as a beautiful, beautiful object. Uh, as you can see, uh, the proportions are very elegant. Uh, you know, the figure is elongated and is in a very elegant contraposto. And she's twisting around her, uh, uh, you know, in this particular view, and of course you can walk around this and look at it in different views. Um, uh, and I suppose the person who originally owned it probably could have even picked it up his hand and turned it around and examined it. Um, so in this view, the face is coming toward us, but looking down, and uh, the arm and the upper torso are turned away, uh, while the pelvis area is, is turned uh, a little bit toward us, a little bit beyond uh, just uh, profile. And of course, as you can see, uh, you know, the legs are ones lifted. Uh, you know, so this is a lovely uh, contrapostos twist to the body. Why do I call it exaggerated? Uh, because you can follow it all around. Uh, this pose, and I should tell you that this is a bronze statue. Uh, this they, sometimes you have more than one of these too, because bronze can be cast, uh, and this one is has been gilded or covered with uh, gold leaf. So that's why it looks so shiny and gold. Um, but it has a spiral pose. Uh, the elegant elongated form. Um, just twists around, and you know you can see this spiral pose. You can see this curving poses from different points of view. Now look at those two. Uh, which one would you call the main point of view? Well, you know you, how how would you say it? You can't. Uh, you want the body seems to be coming more toward us. The other one, the face. Uh, you know, it seems like they're both very interesting point of views. So we often say that with Mannerist art, we have what we call serpentine movement, which if you think of uh, the coiling of a snake, the rattlesnake coiled up, um, and so that's hence serpentine movement. Uh, spiral pose, you know, it's just twisting around. It looks good from many, many different directions. And that it has multiple viewpoints rather than one main viewpoint. Uh, we often say that most Renaissance art uh, think about Michelangelo's David or Pieta, has one main point of view. You know, everybody comes and takes pictures of the David from the same position, unless they just want to get some extra ones, you know. But the ones that's always 
published is, is the same pose, the same place. Uh, there are, of course, figures that just, you know, fit in niches and things like that. But with mannerist art, you almost, you, you really want to have it so all the sides are viewable, you know, in this case on a table, or as we'll see in a minute, uh, in the Loggia della Lanzi, somewhere outside where you can uh, walk around. And uh, here I'm showing you this again with uh, a, a view from the back as well. So you have these uh, serpentine movements, these uh, multiple points of view. Um, just to show you one other work uh, by Jean Bologna, this one is in marble. Uh, this is probably his most famous work. Uh, for one thing, it's right out in public where people can see it. Uh, it is in Florence in what is called the Loggia della, dei Lanzi. Um, which is right next door to the, uh, or right across the street, I guess you could say, from the uh, uh, Palazzo Vecchio. And uh, attached to the Palazzo Vecchio is the Uffizi. So, you know, anybody who's going to go to the Palazzo Vecchio or going to go to uh, the Uffizi, uh, which is now a major uh, picture gallery, uh, one of the world's great painting, gallery, painting galleries. It was originally the offices or the Uffizi uh, uh, designed by uh, Vasari, actually. He was the architect uh, for the Medici. But anyway, right there on your way, you will see this and on uh, many other sculptures that are out in this uh, it's a covered space, but it's open air and you can just sort of uh, walk around them unless they're doing restorations. And unfortunately, when we took these pictures, they you couldn't get in. You could see part two points of view, uh, but you couldn't completely walk around because they had a fence up. Uh, they were doing restoration. Um, but here you see uh, the statue, and there is some question about whether he knew he was going to do the rape of a Sabine woman, or if he just was doing his figures and then said, okay, this will fit the rape of the Sabine woman, we'll call it that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this of course is the story from classical antiquity about uh, how the Romans, uh, you know, Find, uh, founding their new city uh, in Sabine territory, uh, got their brides. They uh, staged a big party, invited the locals who had refused uh, to let them marry their daughters, and grabbed the women and uh, uh, made off with them. And then these became the wives of the Romans. Because after all, you cannot found a great empire or a great republic, a great city that will last for you know, thousands of years, um, unless you have wives. Uh, you know, if it's just males, it, the line will die out. <laughs> the city will be deserted. Uh, so this was how um, the story uh, of, uh, of Romulus uh, plays out. And he gives the signal. Uh, and to get a, lot, a little bit before that, then you know, years later, the Sabans, you know, practice making weapons and get ready to come back and take their uh, daughters and. Uh, other women back, but by this time the women are, you know, they're married, they've had children, uh, they really don't want their fathers and brothers fighting with their husbands, so the women take the children and they plop themselves down in the battlefield between the, the two factions and say, make peace! <laughs> so uh, they do, and uh, the result, of course, is uh, ancient Rome. Is it a myth, or does it have any truth in it? I do not know. <sighs> Now, I want to talk about one other artist who is not a mannerist. She's not going to do elongation or uh, twisting postures. So we might just call her uh, a late Renaissance artist because she is working um, in the second half of the 16th century. Now, you'll notice I said she. Um, custom, in many places, guild laws or against women becoming painters. But there are a few exceptions. Uh, Lavinia Fontana from Bologna is one. Uh, but Lavinia Fontana's father was an artist, and since he didn't have a son, he trained his daughter to follow in his profession. Sofonispa Anguissola, who is one of the most famous women artists of the Renaissance, had a very different background. She was born into the nobility in Cremona. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But first, let's talk about what did she, what did she portray? What did she paint? Well, in this case, this is a little tiny painting. Now, many of her paintings are quite large. Uh, but what they chose for your textbook uh, was uh, it, it's it's almost like a a uh, well, it's a miniature. Uh, 
Um, I was going to say, it's almost like holding a jewel, and the painting is the jewel uh, around your neck. As you can see, it's set like jewelry. Uh, and this is one of her self-portraits, and she did paint uh, many self-portraits. Um, some artists do. Uh, in her case, it's uh, probably several reasons. Uh, one, uh, you know, you, you've got yourself as a model, uh, but it also served uh, as a, a vehicle of her fame. Uh, you know, people wanted uh, pictures of this this woman who actually paints and did a bit more. Now, you are not going to find uh, nude classical figures in Sophonis Anguissola's work. There are a few in Lavinia Fontana's, but one of the difficulties with women um, is this is a period in which the study of the nude is paramount to you becoming, say, a great artist. And this is true from the Renaissance right up through the 19th century. And from the Renaissance right up through the 19th century, women were not allowed to study nude models. It would violate their chastity. It would be totally socially unacceptable. You would be, you know, a fallen woman. You would be terrible. You know, you cannot do that. Um, and so you'll find that many women artists specialized in portraits. As I say, Lavinia Fontana has a wider range, but she also does portraits. Uh, and there are a few religious works of art by Sophonispa. But by and large, most of her work is portraits. Because she can paint somebody wearing their beautiful clothes, and that, of course, is what the nobility wanted to show off, their beautiful clothes, their social status, uh, without violating her modesty. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Sophonisba Aguisola was a member of the nobility. Now, her family had not been noble for a long time. It was her grandfather who was uh, given his patent of nobility. And he did not have a legitimate heir, so he had his uh, son, who was illegitimate, um, legitimized, in other words, uh, a legal, legally declared his heir, legally declared legitimate. Um, and so uh, her father you know, uh, was not born noble, but became noble, as it were. And I, this is my thesis, and I, I presented a paper on this one. It's a paper about her sister, Lucia Anguissola, but I bring in some of these ideas. Um, her father had six daughters before he had a son. And he did something remarkable. He had all of his daughters educated with humanist learning. They learned Latin. They learned music. Well, music was something that a well-bred young lady would do to play the spinet. But then he did something really amazing. He had his two oldest daughters, Sophonispa and her sister Elena or Helena. Um, Helena or Elena became a nun. So we don't know uh, what she did with her painting. Did she do anything in the convent? We don't know. Um, but he had the two oldest daughters trained in painting. Now, generally at this time, if you want to be trained in painting, you're apprenticed. But you can't apprentice a woman, and you can't apprentice a noble woman. Um, so she had art lessons. And the two sisters and their Duena, their chaperone, their governess, whom we sometimes see in the pictures, I'll show you her in a minute, went to the house of the uh, local artist, uh, Bernardino Campi, leading artist in Cremona, and uh, he had his wife there, everything was very well chaperoned, and taught them to paint, and then they, you know, come back to their palazzo. Um, then the two oldest girls, probably particularly Sophonisba, taught the younger girls to paint. Uh, so uh, with the exception of uh, Elena, I think there's uh, usually some painting that's attributed to most of them, maybe not very many. Uh, but uh, we know that Lucia also went and became a painter. Uh, unfortunately, she died very young. Uh, so she did not have the stellar career that her sister did. Um, her sister, Sophonispa Aguisola, whom we see here, uh, became the court painter to the Queen of Spain. And she lived to be, as you can see, quite an old lady. Uh, she, lived, uh, well, she lived well into the 17th century. Um, 
I, there's so many things I could tell you about her, but maybe I'd better uh, stop and go on and show you something else. Incidentally, we don't know her exact birth date. Um, probably, uh, maybe the best guess is Perlin Gary wrote a, um, a master's thesis on this, I believe it was, but she wrote a thesis on this, and then a book, and she suggested that Sophonisca's birth date was uh, 1532, so that's usually the one that I you know, use. Um, I wanted to show you a few other works by Sofonispa Aguisola, and these were works of art that were in uh, earlier editions of the textbook. Uh, they uh, keep changing the picture they're showing. Uh, the first one is a drawing, and the drawing is a boy who was bitten by a crayfish, or sometimes it's called a crab, uh, and this is her little brother, Osdrubale. Uh, the dates of the painting vary widely, um, but I think it's fairly easy to figure out what approximately what date this would be. Uh, we know when Osdrubale was born. He was born in 1551, and he looks like he might be, you know, a, a large, you know, maybe two and a half, but he looks like he's three years old. So if we say he's three years old and he was born in 1551, uh, then it would be 1550. Uh, four as an approximate date. Now, why would people date it later? I mean, you know, this is obviously not a seven-year-old child. Well, I think that one of the reasons is essentially uh, prejudice against women artists. We don't know Sophonispa's birthday, but we do know in the history of art, artists who are very accomplished at an early age. Albrecht Dewar, uh, at 13, we have a drawing of his. Bernini, uh, we have a 13-year-old sculpture by him, and uh, Irving Levin even thinks that he was producing professional work, uh, portrait busts, in his father's studio as early as age 11. Now, when it's a male artist, they say, oh, he's a prodigy. He's working, you know, he's, he's a genius. When it's a female artist, they express amazement. And it's like, well, this couldn't possibly be by this artist, or the date couldn't possibly be this early, because after all, you know, women aren't capable. Well, I hope we've gotten beyond that. <laughs> We're gonna hear about that a little bit later, too. Um, so that may be why they want to date it as late as possible. Uh, I mean, I would say even beyond the realms of possibility. Um, now, this is a very unusual subject, and it shows the originality of Sofonispa Aguisola. Um, her father had sent a drawing of a smiling girl uh, to Michelangelo and asked him to comment on it. And you know, they, I, he should, obviously wanted him to know about his uh, very accomplished daughter. I think that this idea of the uh, girls being so accomplished brought honor to the family. Also, it showed that the family was truly noble. Uh, remember, they had not been for generations and generations uh, nobility. Uh, the father married into the leading family in, uh, in uh, Cremona, and their mother was you know, of the leading family of Cremona. Um, but I, I think that this is one reason he's had his uh, daughters uh, educated. And he didn't know he was going to have a son. After he had six daughters, the son and heir, Asdrubale, was born. And there you see him um, crying because as a little boy, he stuck his fingers into a basket of crayfish or crabs or some kind of crustaceans. And one of them has latched onto his finger and he's crying. Uh, this is a subject that's never been seen before. Uh, one of his sisters, um, maybe Europa, uh, is uh, comforting him. Uh, and um, so it's a very, very unusual subject. Maybe it's Minerva. Oh, the, do the sisters' names are really interesting. Sophonispa, uh, Elena, Lucia, Minerva, Europa, and Anna Maria. 
So, you know, the expected saints' names are in there, but they have a lot of classical Carthaginian names, and this the, 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 um, th this is also in the male line, of course, so Osdrubale. Um, at any rate, her father sent this picture, this drawing that she had done to Michelangelo, and he wrote back, and he said, yes, this is very good. And he kind of gave her an assignment. He said, now, I want you to draw something even harder, a crying boy. And this is what she sent him. Now this is a, as I say, it's a totally unique subject for the time. It's a very unusual subject, everyday life. Uh, there are some other pictures of the time of everyday life, but they're fairly rare. Um, one of the compi actually did one. Um, and showing, you know, so you've got those, the portrait and the everyday subject, uh, but I don't have anything like this with the, the, the boy, you know, bit with the lizard, or excuse me, with the boy bit with the crayfish. Um, this is what we call genre painting. And we usually talk about the heights of genre painting, um, uh, paintings of everyday activities in the 17th century. So, you know, this is very original. Uh, incidentally, Michelangelo gave it to the Duke of Florence, and it remained in his collection, and we believe he must have brought it out and shown it to people. Uh, and we see the influence of this drawing on a very famous artist, uh, Caravaggio, a very famous artist from uh, the around 1600. And he paints a painting of a boy bitten by a lizard. Uh, as opposed to the, the crayfish, and it's uh, not a portrait. It's well, it, it actually, it is a model that we see over and over in his work. Um, then one last picture I want to show you. This is Sofonisba Aguisola uh, painting two of her sisters playing chess. It's sometimes called the chess game. It's called her sisters playing chess, the artist's sisters playing chess, things like that. Um, you can see uh, her uh, younger sisters, and then in the corner, their uh, nurse, governess, chaperone. That ensures that you know that these ladies are absolutely uh, virtuous, chaste. You know, they are always chaperoned. You know, they're wearing very modest clothes with the very, very high necks. Uh, and they are engaged in a pastime of what, the nobility. You know, they're playing chess. And so you have this combination of the everyday activity with these you know, striking portraits. Um, this painting is in Poland, but it was at uh, an exhibition in uh, Washington, D.C. at the National Museum of Women and the Arts, and I got to see it. And it is technically amazing. Um, there's such fine detail in the foreground figures. And then the background is this atmospheric landscape. It's almost like she's showing, yes, I can handle any style. <laughs> so a very accomplished uh, woman Renaissance painter.